Welcome into the first edition of CP Rewind, a brand new series that we're doing here. We're going to have the visuals for it. We'll be posting it as a podcast as well. I'm Tyler. This is Lauren. We'll be with you at about once a month. Every time a sermon series wraps up, we'll be with you and wrap it all up and then get you set for the next one that's upcoming. Before we go on, Lauren, a lot of people in the church, they already know who you are. They've seen you on stage. They've seen you working on various capacities. But very quickly, tell us a little bit about yourself and your history here at Centerpoint. Yeah, so I'm a mom and I have two daughters. I've been attending Center Point since I was really young. Um, been a believer since I was three. So, um, yeah. I think your background tied with mine makes this a fascinating pairing to do this because I've been at Center Point for, I think we're coming up on the one year anniversary yeah, nice, now. Nice. Newlywed as of not even two months right. to my wife who's been here with me alongside me at center point the entire time that i've been at the church we came in got plugged in pretty quick we both work in a variety of fashions she works with the children help with worship all the social media stuff we've been able to work together with yeah. a lot of that and it makes it more exciting that we get to do this together because we've been able to do some stuff behind the scenes and this is something that we've wanted to do pastor jason has wanted to do just have something where we take the sermon series as a whole pack it together, and for about 30 minutes, just rewind everything that unfolded before us. And the first one we get to do it with is retro. retro. Jason was kind of excited that we decided to call this Rewind, and it just so happened that the first series was retro. We thought those went together oh, yeah. really well. I'll let you talk a, bit, a little bit about this first. Old habits that are the future of the church. We dove into four of them, prayer, hearing from God, fasting, and sanctification. That last one, it felt like to me, Lauren, really tied the other three before it together into one bundle. Oh yeah, this has been one of my absolute favorite series. Yes. Um, personally, this is something that I feel like I've been studying for about a year now. Um, I feel like there were several moments where you could hear a pin drop. And so I'm excited to unpack these messages. Um, it's encouraged me to like dive into them more mm -hmm. and um, to kind of dissect what Jason teaches us on a Sunday morning and how we can like further apply that to our lives. So I'm excited to do this. You could hear a pin drop or if you're Pastor Jason on stage and you're keeping, keeping count, you could hear a phone drop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's called me out on that Lots before. Of phones. And I, I noticed that theme. I love that you bring up the idea that it's challenging because that's something that there are some sermons that you'll hear that go to one edge of that spectrum where you're listening and it's almost too much of a challenge where you feel like you're being called out and it's almost like a negative feeling that mm. you get inside. These almost felt like positive challenges of these are things that you can do that will benefit you. Here are those benefits and here's how to do it, which leads us to the first one, prayer. And there was a YouTube comment on the video. If you haven't seen it yet, the sermon on YouTube is titled, Does Prayer Still Work? And this comment stood out to me so much, and I'm going to read it as it was. This has been my favorite message so far and has been super helpful for me because I literally had no idea how to pray. Most churches think we already know this and never bring up how. Thank you so much for this. And I think, Lauren, that was the number one thing that stood out to me because I'd never really thought about it that way. You said that you've been saved since you were young. I've been in church all my life, too. You just hear all the time, pray about this, pray about this, pray yeah. about these things. The how sometimes doesn't get included in that conversation. Yeah, it gets lost a lot. Yes. And you can tell there were so many people in our church that really... Um, absorbed this message and grew from it. And I think one of the things that stuck out to me the most was when Pastor Jason said to pray what you got, which yes. I know he um, learned that from John McComer. He says that in his in his message. And so what does that look like, praying what you got? All I have today is fear and worry. Cool, pray it. Tell God about it. All I have is stress. Okay, pray. I've got thankfulness today. I, I got needs. I got, okay, pray what you got. What'd you bring in? Cool. Pray that to God. I was in a service earlier this week and um, I was trying to drown out the voices, like all the noise, all the internal noise, <laughs> external. And even at home, sometimes when I'm alone, that can be hard to do. And I found myself beating myself up of like, I'm trying to have a conversation with God. What am I supposed to be praying about? What am I supposed to be talking about right now? And in the middle of this worship service, I just felt these tears kind of roll down my face. And I remember like, pray what you got. And I was like, God, I've got pain today. You know, sometimes what you've got is an emotion, you know, yeah. and or it's one word and that's OK. Um, and I think that was super impactful to kind of hear that and to find out that it's OK if what you have is what you what you have feels very little. Something else that Jason brought up was to be intentional mm -hmm. about it. And that intentionality can then link us to hearing from God. When we're intentional about what we want, God is intentional about letting us know what he wants as well. But before we move on to actually hearing from God in that yeah. sermon, there was another thing that, that you brought up that I really loved. 
And it's this idea that for us as people, because we're very prideful, very naturally, and sometimes yeah. we don't realize, and sometimes it's not hugely intentional to go back to that word, pride oftentimes can very easily get in the way of prayer. Yeah. I know you were going to ask me about this, but at home, I was really wondering, what does pride blocks prayer look like in your life, honestly? Yeah. It, it's one of those things for me where I'm a control freak. I 100%, not just in terms of the things happening in my life, but if something goes wrong, I want to be the one to fix yeah. it. So for me, it gets in the way when something is either not even something bad is happening, but when there's a situation where I think that I've got it fully under control mm -hmm. and I think that I can handle it. If it's something bad, I think that I can fix it. If it's something good, then I think I can keep it going. Yeah. That's when pride gets in the way because mm -hmm. I don't think to pray about it or I'm not going to pray about it because I've got it. I, I don't need I don't need to pray about this thing if I've got it under control. It's that idea again that I mentioned earlier of only get, going to God when you've got a need mm -hmm. or a want and yeah. finally waiting until, oh, well, what I thought I had, I don't have. Now I go to God yeah. with it. So for me, that's what it looks like. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's more of a time commitment, you yeah. know, like you have to lay down yourself to make time and space for prayer. You know, it's not like reading the word where you're learning things. Um, it's a literal kind of a selfless act to carve out that time and space for it. I think a lot of these things, and we'll wrap on prayer and then move on to hearing from God. But I, I think of when you're a toddler and your parents or grandparents or whoever your guardian is, is trying to teach you to do the very basic things. And I, the number one example that I always think of is brushing our teeth. For some reason, no one wants as to do kids, it. <laughs> and not just as a toddler, like eight, nine, 10, if you're 25 and watching this and you yep. still don't like brushing your teeth, that's okay. I hope you're doing it though. Mm -hmm. We don't like to do these it's things. True. And then as you do it more, you do it more, you do it more. Eventually yeah. you wake up and automatically, what do you do? You brush your teeth. Yeah. It just starts to happen automatically. And it's A, because it's just become part of your routine. Yeah. But B, I think the other big part of it is as we get older, we learn what the other side of it looks like. Mm. So we know why we're brushing yeah. our teeth. We know what happens if we the, don't brush our teeth. The benefits yes. of it, yeah. But starting small, like you said, that's kind of key. It's baby steps. And uh, that's going to be a, a big thing that we talk about, especially when we get to the final sermon of this, yeah. is all of the steps matter they in do. this process. And another one of those steps, hearing from God, the sermon, if you didn't hear it, God speaks, who is listening. I had a guest preacher come in. That was... I wasn't here on the Sunday for the service, but I got mm. to go back and watch it. And what a great word mm -hmm. we got. And Lauren, it stood out to you, the opening illustration. Walk us through that, the flash blizzard and the rope and this idea that in that situation, the rope is hearing from God. Yeah, he. this was Pastor Adam French, and he came in the week that it was actually snowing yes. here. And he talked about flash blizzard, and I guess this is something that happens in different parts of the country where it is so snowy that you can't even see in front of you, and that people will tie a rope to their house so that if they are out when this happens, because it happens so quickly, that they can pull themselves back in, and that this is this is hearing from God. Like he is our lifeline. Like he is that rope for us. I truly, truly believe that the rope in our spiritual life is the ability to hear from God. And it's the most under, under, underutilized tool in the Christian faith. And we know this, God speaks, but the question is, who's listening? One thing that was talked about over and over again in that sermon was the idea that God speaks in the silence, mm. which goes back to prayer. We want to find a silent spot and isolate so you can speak to God. But Lauren, we see in scripture over and over, this goes twofold. God wants to speak to us through that silence as well. Yeah, he does. It's a still small voice sometimes. Yes. And it's hard, like I was saying earlier, to drown out that internal and external noise um, that's in our minds or that's around us. Yeah, but it's key. We have to. And there was a really good example given in the sermon. It goes through this idea of a walkie-talkie. Hmm. And we have to remember it who is on yes, the, who's other, on the end. other side of that? Yeah. I've thought about that a lot. Um, there was actually something that he referenced. He referenced um, a scripture in Revelation, mm -hmm. and it says, Let anyone who has ears to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And um, I think you did the research on this, that that was used, I guess, seven times in the book of Revelation. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I just, for whatever reason, that scripture stuck out to me. So I went to did a little bit of digging, essentially. Mm -hmm. So what my, what my Bible says, it says, in Revelation 2, verse 7, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. 
to the one who conquers, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And my context basically says the one that conquers, the one that is faithful and obedient, and that there's spiritual rewards. And so essentially, we're kind of leaving spiritual rewards on the table yeah. by not walking out this faithfulness and obedience. And it was really cool because um, my context also said that this is an echo in scripture. So these are words in red that Jesus says, and he also wow. uses these same words in Matthew when he's talking about the parable of the sower. Wow. And um, as he's talking about the parable of the sower, we know he talks about four different soils, right? Mm -hmm. And the fourth soil produces good fruit, which is what we're trying to do this year, right? We're growing roots, we're growing fruits. Yes. And um, that's the sign of a true disciple. And what's interesting is at the end of this parable, Jesus says the same thing. Let anyone who has ears listen. And you find the disciples in between the parable and the interpretation of the parable, right in the middle of that chapter, the disciples asked Jesus, like, hey, why are you talking this way? Why are you talking in parables? And Jesus responds that he wants to reveal the kingdom of God to you. And that's the whole thing is when I think about who's on the other side of the walkie talkie, I have a God who isn't waiting for me to get to glory, to experience his glory. Like he wants to reveal his kingdom and who he is to us like right now. Right. And that's exciting to me. Another thing that Pastor Jason said during the, ser the sermon series is that that love does not waver and that desire to be with us also does not waver regardless of where we are because Lauren if from the jump we were at the end of our journey what would be the point exactly. of all of this and a God that can help yeah. us figure out where we're going yeah sanctification is a process yep. um, all of these things like you're talking about we call them spiritual disciplines they're things that we should be practicing um, to have in rhythm like to have these rhythms in our life um, with the goal of yeah becoming more like Jesus yeah, and admittedly, they can be hard. Yeah, both for us, especially this next one. <laughs> the, the next one in particular is probably the hardest, and yes. that's probably why I can say um, factually on my end, this is the first sermon that I've ever heard about fasting. Really? Have you ever heard a sermon about fasting? You know, I, not that I can recall. Yeah, I'd never heard one, and I've been in church since as long as I can remember. I've never now I've heard verses with sure, fasting sure, mentioned, and yeah. it's usually brushed over. Yeah. And maybe you'll hear the definition of what fasting is. And that's what I, the first thing that stood out to me is Pastor Jason saying that it was mentioned 77 times in the Bible, that's a lot. and yet it's rarely talked about in the church. And the other thing that caught my ear. Jesus, when he spoke about fasting, it wasn't this idea of if you fast, if this happens mm. to happen, yeah. it was a when you fast. When it was an fast. assumption that this was going to be done moving forward. I can say, while it was probably the most challenging message to For hear, sure. it's completely changed my perception on the idea of a, not just what fasting is. We know what the definition of it is, but the purpose now just has so much more significance. Yeah, um, it's true that that fasting coming alongside of prayer, that it's going to amplify yes. you know, our prayer life. Um, it does empty. We have to empty ourselves. I think that's something that we both agreed on with his message was the point of we have to empty ourselves in order to be filled. Mm -hmm. And so fasting, he talked about there's different ways to fast, right? Uh, and when we're talking about fasting from food, yeah, we're... We are pausing from enjoying the pleasures of life to be dependent on him and to need him as our actual bread, you know? Yeah, and this is something that we had talked about uh, before we were getting ready to record this. And I'm sure that's something that was on the minds of a lot of people. It was actually funny enough, me and my wife had been having a conversation related to the idea of fasting. And this is before we even knew what the sermon was going to be mm. about, not doing it with food, but with social media. Mm. We said that was the number one thing for us that... We felt like in our lives, not that we need to purposely get rid of, but it's just something that maybe we consume too much of or it takes up too much of our time to where it can block our purpose. Is there something in your life? Is it also, I know for a lot of us, it is social media. Is it, what does that look like for you in your life? Oh man. Um, I don't know that social media is, is, is my thing, mm -hmm. you know, that stronghold, uh, I will say just this message, yes, was super challenging and I had to kind of do a lot of reflection mm -hmm. as to why I felt like it was so challenging. Um, the other spiritual disciplines, I feel like I enjoy, you know, but fasting, it does not sound fun to me right. I mean, at all. Like what about that God sounds fun? Seems pretty cool. Yes. Yes. Giving up food as no. someone that on the way down to record this stopped and got not just a combo at Taco <laughs> oh, Bell. There's but a McDonald's <laughs> bag in my, in the floor of my car. Yeah. I got a combo. 100%. I added on a side of nacho fries. Like I yes. was ready to go. Yes. I got a sugar-free Baja blast. So I, you know, oh, good, I at least good, covered good. that, but balance. this balance. is, this one doesn't quite sound as appealing as the no, other two. No, not at all. And if I can be just really honest, um, when I really thought about why don't I fast? Like if right. I know 
the power in it. Um, why don't I do this? Like, what, why am I um, blocking myself from receiving what God has for me? Um, and so when I really looked at it, though, it came down to fear, mm. a lot of fear. Um, why would I want to commit to God, to myself, maybe to an accountability partner uh, that I want to fast from food specifically? Yeah. Why would I want to do that? And then get to three o'clock in the afternoon. My kids are upset. Work has been stressful. And all I can think about is I just want an ice cold Dr. Pepper. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, why Why do I want to put myself through that or attempt doing this? Um, I realize it's just a fear. It's a fear of failure. Yeah. It's a fear of letting God down, letting myself down, fear of not getting through it. Um, there's that voice in my head that's like, Lauren, you can't even stick to like a healthy eating plan for like 48 hours. How are you going to fast from food and drink for 24, yeah. you know? And so when I really analyzed that, uh, what was really comforting is I just felt like, you know, that's not our father. Yeah. Um, our father's not sitting in heaven with a gavel waiting for us to fail. Like he so, yeah, embraces. That, that remember that time that you said you were going to yeah. fast for a week and you only got through yeah. five days. Yeah. And so this has been transformative for me this week because I realized this is a part of God's character that I was missing. Yeah. Like I was missing his kindness. I was missing his mercy, um, that he's not expecting perfection from me, but it's about the progress, right? Yeah. And that's, that's something that we're going to talk about a lot more when we get to that final sermon, just celebrating the steps along yeah. the way. If you fast for three days, don't be down on yourself because you didn't get to four. Be proud yeah. of yourself because you got past exactly. two. And then try exactly. it again and build and build yeah. and build. And the other side of that is you mentioned fear. And there's mm -hmm. always a fear for us that we're going to let ourselves down. For me, what creeps in is this idea that let's say I set out to do this for seven days. Mm -hmm. I do it for seven days. I achieve it. And seemingly on the front end, nothing happens. Oh, yeah. There's the flip side of and. This is common. Like, I didn't even think Pastor about Pastor Jason that. spoke about this, or there's times where he's fasted mm. and he hasn't heard anything. And we heard um, Adam French speak about as well. There are times where he wants to sit and dedicate himself to hearing from God and he doesn't hear anything. Mm. But every time he's heard something, it sticks with him. And every time you have that thing occur, it sticks with you. So I do think it's an interesting thing to struggle yeah. with. And I'd love to hear what you think about it because... Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one, or maybe now that I've brought it up, it's something that's going to sit there in the mind, but it is hard because there are a lot of things in the Bible where it's not a hundred percent guaranteed. It's not guaranteed every time you pray that that prayer exactly. is going to be answered. Yeah. It's not guaranteed every time you sit and you try to hear from God that you're going to hear from him. And yet we're incentivized to keep doing it because we know what can happen. Yeah, for sure. We do. There is a level in which we have to be okay with recognizing that some of the things that we do in the unseen, we might not see the benefits of that yeah. play out in immediate time yeah. frame. You know, um, it's just like planting seeds with people. You know what I mean? Mm. Like we might never see um, what God actually has done with something. But I do right. believe, especially with this prayer and fasting, that if this is something that we're incorporating into our into our spiritual walk, that it's the overtime benefit Absolutely. that we're going to that, see. That's where I lean with it because those are those are thoughts that and. You, the voice in your head, mm -hmm. even after you've completed a week of fasting, it's still trying to get after you yeah. and tell you, well, you did this. It didn't work. So don't ever do it again. That's going to be there. And the other side of it is if every time we did something like that, it was 100 percent successful and we got exactly what we wanted from it, then we're in control. For sure. If we're in control and we're doing these things and we get exactly what we desire, well, then we're the ones that are exactly. pulling the strings for everything. Yeah, that's good. Last thing we'll talk about, and again, as we reference, kind of wraps everything together. Mm -hmm. Holiness and sanctification. I was trying to figure out uh, what, what to name this one. This and it was, a, it was a term that Jason came up with, God's love language, which mm -hmm. ultimately is obedience yeah. and ties very well into all of this, Lauren. And I, I tracked it. Luke 6, 46, I thought was a beautiful way to sum all this up. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do what I tell you. That verse itself convicted me because oh, I was yeah. like, man, that's a big one. And, and overall, obviously the goal of this sermon, none of these is to 100% just convict. Sure. If you feel something there, there's a reason for that, but there's always a positive spin. As Jason said, it's called good news for a reason. Yeah. This one hit pretty hard. Yeah, this is that iron to iron. This is the sharpening that we need, um, the edification that we need as a body to know, it says it throughout scripture, a lot of places, even in Ecclesiastes, it sums up that book with saying, um, 
all in all, it says fear God and keep his commandments. Yep. You know what I mean? Like if you love him, you will obey him. He loves um, to be obeyed. That's how mm-hmm. that's how he is. And we show our love for him through faithful obedience. Yeah, and something that was really encouraging to me was this idea of holiness for God versus what holiness looks like for us. Because obviously we are not God. Right. If we were, we wouldn't need to we do all of this. And then that definition for us, holiness for us, I think is spectacular. The idea of being set apart yeah. for God. And because of that, understanding the value mm. that we really have because of who we're created by and who we're set apart yeah. for. is That's something that Pastor Jason really dove into was that idea of now especially understanding the value we all have. Yeah. Um, I think about how important it is to realize that when he looks at us, he sees what is sunded on the cross for yes. us. And that's what sets us apart. And that's why we try to live the sanctification process so that we can be set apart in the world and draw others to him mm-hmm. by the way that we live. Then it really took on a new meaning when he got to this part about how the audience matters. And the thought that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. I don't know about you, Lauren. That hit me in the face like a son of a bitch. It got kind of (laughs) awkward in second service when when we went down this road um, because he gave a really practical example of this. And yeah, the the audience matters. And he's talking about not being a stumbling block to others. That just because we have liberties um, doesn't mean that it's not going to cause the next person to stumble. And so we do have to know uh, that the world is watching us. Yeah. Let's break this down into something a lot more practical for you and I. Some of you are perfectly fine with having a glass of wine with your dinner. You Methodists have two glasses of wine with your dinner. Does the Bible call that a sin? Some of you may say yes, some of you may not. But what if I invite somebody from church over to my house who's a new believer that comes out of the background of alcoholism, and for them that's an area that they still don't know and they don't understand, and you just invite them to your house and they see you drinking? Can you? Do you have the right does it mean you should? I think about this too, not just from a broad perspective, but in those personal interactions, especially in situations where I look and there's specific friends of mine who I know may not be of the faith. And I can sit there and I can talk to them all day long. I can read them verse after verse after verse of scripture. Mm. And that isn't going to have no. an impact. But the way that I act and the way that I speak and the way that I handle certain situations can be the most profound thing of all. Yeah, actually, it's it's interesting because my daughter and I, my oldest daughter, we just talked about this the other day because they're learning this in kids. And she told me about how one of her teachers taught her and spoke to her about how, like, if you are going to go reach the lost or, you know, tell someone about Jesus, it's probably not going to be effective if you go in there and just, you know, read the Bible straight to them and like, you know, throw it in their face for like a better It would be cool words. if we could go up to people and say, here's John three sixteen. Yeah, and, and they just in. believed, and then they're on board, yes. right? And they get to love Jesus like we love Jesus. That would be amazing. But re- the reality is, and my, my oldest said this, like we share Jesus by sharing his love, yeah. ultimately, like that through relationship with others too. And so the audience matters, who we, who we have in front of us. Are we sharing the love of God? And it's super convicting. Jason was talking about um, what have I done personally that maybe has led somebody else down? Um, the wrong yeah. road. Yeah. There's so much weight mm. on this yeah. in that, yes, holiness and sanctification, it's for us. Yeah. It, there's a personal aspect to it, obviously, but there are such implications outside yeah. of just ourselves. And that's another thing that Jason spoke on was the idea that it is about us, but it's not only about us. It's not. And that's when it really starts to hit that importance yeah. and not a pressure, but it, it then almost becomes a privilege yeah, of, all right, I am, this is how I can see that I'm doing something for the yeah. kingdom of God. And this is how I can do it. Yeah. He often says, what does he say? He says something about, um, you have to like, growing, you have to disagree with yourself Yes, essentially. Yeah. And that's what this is, is you have to make decisions of things that you would have been okay with in your past. And you're putting yourself, um, you're becoming selfless so that others can see him. The last thing that I want to talk about, and this stood out to both of us. I noticed that, uh, before I had posted the YouTube video for this, because for those that don't know, I make all those thumbnails and put them all together. You had shared the Facebook video of the sermon with, uh, I think you put progress over perfection. And then I made the thumbnail, and this is before I had seen it, 
I put on the thumbnail progress and then under it the word perfection. I did not realize that. That's hilarious. Crossed out. So we had the exact same That's thought cool. on this. We had That's the cool. exact same thing that stood out. This idea of progress of having such a significance. Not the perfection doesn't matter right. because we have what we have because of a Jesus who was perfect yeah. and granted this to us. But this idea that we want the church to be a safe place where progress is celebrated and failure is okay because we're going to fail, but that's what makes the progress so important. And the significance of celebrating, like we talked about mm. with fasting, any of these disciplines, mm. celebrating the baby steps, but not settling yeah. for those and still continuing to look to grow. Yeah, that was the most comforting takeaway. Yes. For sure. Like that is grace. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right there. That's what eliminates the fear of going down the road of trying to implement these disciplines into our everyday life mm -hmm. is realizing that he is our Heavenly Father. Like I said earlier, that's not expecting perfection. He just wants time with us. Yes. Uh, he wants to um, know us and to be known. That's one thing that I've had to work on in my life and my prayer life is not just celebrating my successes, but looking back on the things in my journey mm -hmm. that God has gotten me through or the points where I can see that the dominoes fell down to get yep. me to a certain point, moving from just recognizing it to celebrating it yeah. so that it has significance. And I can look back and say, well, it's not just that he did this. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that he did this and I'm celebrating yeah. that God did this and moving that into a personal life because I know this, it probably applies to you too. It's really hard to celebrate your own accomplishments yeah. sometimes because we tend to minimize. I think some people are do. so good at celebrating. I actually think about our pastor, like he's he celebrates the wins all the time. Yes. Uh, I'm not naturally bent to celebrate. That sounds yeah. bad, but I'm just not, you know? I, and so I, I have am more to... affected by failure exactly. than I tend to 100%. celebrate success. Yeah. And I think a lot of us are like that. And it's very hard to move past it, yeah. but that's why having a safe place to fail is super important. John Mark Comer says that these spiritual disciplines that we're talking about mm -hmm. are doing what we can do in order for God to grow and mature us to be able to eventually do what we cannot do. Wow. And that's the point of this, right? Yeah. Um, so that we can do what the Nike slogan, just do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We do what we can do in the natural so that he can move through us in the supernatural. I think that bleeds right into the idea of those, the future of the church. Mm -hmm. That's how the church stands out from the world yeah. and to the world. And it's the idea that Jason wrapped it all up on with the idea that the message is in pen, yeah. but the methods are in pencil. Definitely. And we've still got this whole message that we can continue to work through. And we have these, again, proven things that Jesus himself just yeah. assumed we'd always do. Yeah. They're there and we can utilize them as well. So that brings us through retro and coming up next, I'm excited for this. I know you are too. Listen. If nothing else, just by the branding, I'm excited the for branding. summer camp romance is the next sermon series here at CP. I was pretty impressed. With that that was good. That was good. Everybody that comes to the first sermon on Sunday, you're getting one of these. We have 500 of them. So I say everybody got to be there yeah. quick. We got 500. We would love to have enough people here that we've got 500. It's true. And that's not enough for everybody's here. Come everybody on. that's here. And if we've got that many people, we'll find more of them some way, somehow. I'm going to read out the description that okay. Jason Let's has for Let's this. And then we can talk quickly about thoughts that we have, things that we're looking forward to. A summer camp romance is an idea of two people falling in love quickly at summer camp. It feels so real and so intense, then it fades away slowly when you go back home. This is the same way we are at times with our relationship with God. It isn't supposed to be this way. There is a better way. What stands out to you the most besides the fact that we're looking at getting... I don't know because I don't know that I've ever actually had a summer camp romance. So I'm trying to like <laughs> really, you know, apply this to my life. But yeah, just... We do. We go through seasons where um, our spiritual life is just heightened. And then because maybe a lack of spiritual disciplines, yeah. we kind of get off rhythm and get distracted. And so, yeah, I think it's how do we how do we live continuously um, knowing knowing who he is and how much he loves us, you know, and living from that yeah. place. I feel like building off that, it makes it a really good back to back. And it's almost like mm. someone planned the schedule yeah, for this to be what follows up <laughs> the retro series. Yeah. It's going to be a blast. Summer camp romance. It starts this Sunday. Be there. Come get you one of these. We'll be there. Come say hi. Lauren, this has been a blast. This has been fun. We'll do it again after summer camp romance. We'll be with you in about a yeah. month. Thank you for stopping by for our first edition. See you Sunday.